Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody, and here's program number four already, and then we can be heading out for home. So those of you joining us on television, again, we want to thank you for your prayers more than anything, but uh, also for your letters and your financial help. Naturally, we can't do this without, you know, when we first, I got to tell things like that. This, I think, is what makes our program. You know, when we first came up here to talk to these station people. They were the ones that called. And they wanted us to make a program. So we came up here and had a breakfast meeting with them and uh, found out it was going to cost us like 2000 a month for one program a week and the production and everything. Iris doesn't say anything until we get to the car. And she said, Les, I thought they paid us. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I imagine a lot of people think that because where do these Hollywood people get all their bucks? Well, you know, from what they do. And so it was a logical response because we didn't know anything about TV. You know, we were, as I always tell people, we were as ignorant as a clod of dirt when it came to television. <laughs> but anyway, here we are, and uh, we have to pay for TV time. Uh, the television people don't pay us a dime. Okay. We're going to keep on uh, the dispensational view, and uh, we're going to come back to these mysteries in our next taping. But for this next half hour, at least the first part of it, we're going to start at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. A little different approach. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Now Paul is writing to the believers at Corinth who were not exactly the most spiritual of all his people. And so he says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers, see there's that word again, as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What's a steward? Well, let's look scripturally. Go back to Genesis Chapter 15, Abraham. Genesis, chapter 15. Let's go first, keep your hand in 15. Go back to chapter 12 again, Abrahamic covenant, just for a second. So that you'll know what Abraham is, or Abram, I think is still, yeah, it's still Abram, and what he's up against. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation. Now, that's as far as we have to go to get my point. What would Abraham have to have if a nation is going to come from him? Children. How many does he have? None. See? All right, and so here he's just almost befuddled with the idea, how can people come from me, and even if it's my own wife, Sarai, when we don't have a child? And it was plaguing him, see? All right, now then you come over to chapter 15, still in Genesis, and uh, still no child, and still the promises keep ringing in his ear. All right, so chapter 15, verse 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now verse 2. Now don't forget the fact that Abram is 90 and Sarah is 80, and they still won't have a child until he's 100 and she's 90, but nevertheless they're up past already childbearing age. Now Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? What do you mean? What's a steward? A manager. See, an overseer, an administrator. 
Now we know Abram had tremendous wealth. He had men servants and women servants. He had cattle and sheep and goats and uh, he couldn't run it all himself. And so he had this steward, this overseer, this manager, Eliezer of Damascus. All right, now come back to 1 Corinthians 4 and maybe this verse will mean a little more to you. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards, managers, overseers, promoters, all the things that made an operation go, that's what we are to be, but not of a business, not of a farm and ranch operation, but of what? The mysteries. See? So every one of us as believers are stewards of this body of truth. It's up to us to get it out in front of people every opportunity that we get in one place or another. You don't have to use all of them at once, but let people know, hey, this is where it's at. And you won't find that back in the four Gospels. You won't find this back in the Old Testament. You won't find it in the book of Revelation. You find it only between Romans and Philemon, see? And that's why I'm constantly stressing study Paul's epistles. Now, you don't throw the rest of your Bible away. You know I don't teach that. I just used it. Man, I love to use Genesis. I love to use the prophets. But I'm not going to take people back there to show them how to be saved. I'm not going to take them back there to show them how to live the Christian life in 2000, wherever we are. But we are to be stewards of these basic premises that we are calling now the mysteries of Christ and of God and so forth. All right? Let's just read on here a little bit. Verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards, overseers, or managers, that a man be found what? Faithful. Now, I imagine everyone in this room has known of someone who has been a victim of embezzlement or of a poor manager. I know I've known several in my lifetime who just simply got taken to the cleaners by an embezzler. I think of another fellow who had managers of his operation and they stole him blind till he almost went broke. Well, you see, it's the same thing in the spiritual. If we are going to keep all this to ourselves and never pass it on, are we going to enhance the body of Christ? No, we've got to share it. Now, that, like I said, you don't have to know all seven of these and pass them out at one time. But be ready. Be ready to share these things that most of Christendom knows nothing of. They don't hear it. They don't hear it. Because most of Christendom ignores Paul. That's the basic problem. But this is where we ought to understand that as believers in this age of grace, we are stewards, we are household managers of this body of truth that we call the dispensation of the grace of God. All right? I hardly know where to go first because there's so much to cover and, and I don't want to get it all mixed up. But uh, let me just continue on here in 1 Corinthians 4. And... Uh, some of these verses disturb people. Well, I can't help that because it's what the book says. Come on over with me now in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 4, and go to verse 16. And remember, what's the basic instruction at the beginning of the chapter? Be stewards. As ministers of Christ, be stewards of these mysteries of God. Now, how are we going to be a good steward? Well, we have to be taught. You don't just automatically come in and run somebody's business without some training. So where do we get our training? All right, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16. And like I said, people don't like this. They can't help that. Wherefore, Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not by Paul's own idea, but he says, wherefore, I beseech you, be you followers. Now, most people think it should say Jesus, but it doesn't. It says, followers of whom? Me, Paul, see? Now, don't worry, I'm coming to the right point. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 
Now verse 1. Now this will set your mind at ease. <coughs> First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. All got it? Be ye followers of me, but don't leave the rest of the verse out, even as I also a follower of Christ. You see that? Now see, this apostle had direct communion with the Christ in glory. He had direct fellowship in more areas than one. In fact, let me just give you an example. I've got to back everything up with Scripture. I can't help it. Come back with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 22. This is even beside his experience on the road to Damascus. This is years later. So I know that the man was in fellowship with the ascended Lord. Acts 22, come in at verse 17. Now he's been out amongst the Gentiles. He's been establishing these little congregations, and now he's back in Jerusalem because he always had a heart for his fellow Jews. And he would bring back offerings to take care of the poor Jews in Jerusalem. And so here's one of his instances where he has come back to Jerusalem from his Gentile travels. Acts 22, verse 17. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem. See, this wasn't the first time. When I had come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. He had a vision. And I saw him, the Lord Jesus himself. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they, the Jews, will not receive thy testimony concerning me. See? All right, then he actually argues with the Lord. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prison and beaten every synagogue of them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death. And I kept, or I held the raiment of them that killed him. And he, the Lord Jesus, said unto me, Depart. Depart what? Jerusalem. Get out. See? Depart for I will send thee far hence to the Gentiles. That's where his ministry was. Not in Jerusalem, but out into the Gentile world. So we know that he had constant communion with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. All right, let's go over a little further to Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Chapter 3. Verse 17, honey. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. See, now here's three distinct instructions of who we are to follow. And most of Christendom gets all upset and says, I'm not going to follow some man, I'm going to follow Jesus. Well, listen. God gave to this man this place of apostleship. Christ himself designated as the apostle of the Gentile. And as this man follows Christ, we are to follow him. And here's the third one now in just these few references. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them who walk so as you have us for an example. Now, how did Paul walk? Above reproach. You cannot find one word of Scripture that anybody ever had anything to malign the Apostles' Christian walk, if we want to call it that. Never. He was above reproach and suffered for it for 20-some years. And so when I maintain that as our Apostle, this is where we spend our time, are in his letters, because it is. It's God's letter to us as Gentiles, and it's through his letters that we not only find salvation, but the Christian walk. In fact, uh, let's just go to Titus a minute. Keep on going, Philippians through the Thessalonians, Timothy, and then we'll come to Titus. Chapter 2. 
Now, who in the world can argue against these kind of admonitions? Titus chapter 2, did I give you the verse, honey? Verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God. See, Paul is always on that grace thing. We're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, and we look forward to whatever eternity is coming by grace. We don't deserve any of it. All right, so the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. No one is going to be able to say, but I never had a chance. I just told my class the other night here in Oklahoma, don't ask me to explain that. I can't. But there are three scripture references that maintain that every human being has had an opportunity. Now I'm getting looks of consternation. I have to stop right there. Come back with me to John's Gospel because I don't like to say things like that and then leave it hanging by a cotton thread. Go back to John's Gospel. Chapter 1. John's Gospel. Chapter 1. I might as well, in order to make it clear as clear can make it, we'll start at verse 6. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 6. And we're dealing with John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. Now that's capitalized, so it's a reference to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All right, he came to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. How many? All. See? All right. He was not that light, speaking of John, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now verse 9. My, this blows me away. I can't explain it. I have to just leave it where it sets, and you can do the same thing. That was the true light, Jesus of Nazareth in his earthly ministry. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. How many? Every last one. The Aborigines in the middle of Australia? Yeah. The pagans, wherever they may be in the world? Yes. Nobody is going to come before the great white throne and say, but God, I never had a chance. You know why? Scripture. Now come over with me to Romans, and then we'll go back to Titus. I'm not through there. Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. Let's start at verse 18. Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God, not the love of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifested in them. In other words, God just puts it in the spotlight, and there it is. No argument. For God hath showed it unto them. Shown what? Their unrighteousness, their wickedness, see? Now verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, in other words, who he is, so that they, the unsaved multitudes, are what? Without excuse. Now just let that soak in. Every human being is somehow or other enlightened enough that they could cash in and have salvation, but they refuse to. And so when they come before the great white throne, they are not going to have one word of argument because they're going to know that I'm here without an excuse. Now that's one of the quirks of Scripture. Like I said, I can't answer it, so we'll just wait till we get there. 
But it's a fact that Christ died for every human being that has ever lived. You know, I get a lot of things in the mail. And I had an interesting one. And if the lady is watching me in a few weeks, so be it. Because I, I wrote back to her exactly what I'm saying now. And uh, a good friend of hers had given her the previous Sunday's church bulletin in which the pastor had an article that, you know, I could agree with. I had no problem. But this lady was all shook up. And she wrote across the bottom. She said, Les, I don't think I can agree with this. And what the pastor was pointing out was how that Christ suffered so horrendously for the sin of the world. And she didn't think she could agree with it, so this is what I wrote back. By the time the program reaches her, she'll have already read, read my letter. I said, my dear lady, now you're talking like these Jesus seminar liberals who the last comment I read from one of them was, how in the world could any father cause his son to go through what Jesus went through? And that's how they ridicule it. How would anybody with any common sense make their son suffer like that? And so I said, you sound like some of these Jesus seminars. I said, listen, the whole idea of his suffering was that he was taking the sin debt for the whole whole human race. Not just a few thousand or a few million Jews, but for the whole human race. And then I gave her an example that we had experienced in Israel one day, and that goes back quite a few years, and we were still able to go into the Dome of the Rock. The Muslim, they don't like to call it a mosque, it's a shrine. But in those days, we could still take off our shoes and we could go in, and so inside the Dome of the Rock, is this huge rock where supposedly Abraham offered Isaac. And it's got a retaining fence around it. So anyhow, the guide had our little small group of us right there at the high point of the rock, and he was explaining how that some of the Jews feel that that was the exact place of the ark at which they slaughtered all the animals. And the unique thing was that as that animal blood would go right down into a cavern and it would go out into the river Kidron. And so our little Jewish guide was expressing the same kind of thought. He says, you know, folks, he said, I just cannot believe that God would require people to kill these innocent lambs. And he says, many times that lamb was even the household pet. And I stopped him right there. And I says, now, wait a minute. Don't you understand? The reason God set up that sacrificial system, and yes, that made it all the more impact if it was the household pet, that that Jew's sin is what caused that animal to die. He had to see the horribleness of his own sin. Well, it's the same way with the cross, see? We have to understand that when Christ suffered and died, he does it because of our sin. And sin in the eyes of God is awful. We've lost it, see? All right, so this is what we have to understand, that God wasn't being unfair to his son. He wasn't being morbid. He was doing what had to be done. Someone had to to suffer and die for the sins of mankind. And who could do it but God himself? See, that's why he had to be God. All right, now then, that was all free for nothing. Come back to where we were in Titus, and then we'll close. Titus chapter 2 now. This is what we mean by following the writings of Paul. It's so logical. It's so appropriate. Verse 11 again. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. But for us who believe, now the next verse kicks in. The grace of God teaches you and I as a believer, as a child of God, as a joint heir with Christ, remember. All right, and it is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts or desires, instead of partaking, we deny them and in its place, we live soberly. Now, that means 
That doesn't mean you can't ever laugh or smile or have a good time, no. But it means that we're not going to be frivolous. We're not going to be with the crazy stuff of the unsaved world. We live soberly, righteously, and godly. Now, that's a small g. Now, where did the word Christian come from? Christ-like, that's right. See, that's what the pagan world, it was actually a, a slur term when it first originated that the pagans put on these believers who thought they were Christ-like, and so they called them Christians. All right, that's what we've got here. We are to live Christ-like. Now there, you can go to the teachings of Jesus. I got no problem with that. And when he says that we are to be salt, the earth, absolutely we are to be. Are we to be the light? Sure, we are to be the light. And so many of the other things that he taught are certainly appropriate. But by and large, we come back to how does the Apostle Paul put it? We deny ungodliness, we deny worldly lusts and desires, and instead we live soberly, we live righteously, we live godly, see? Instead of with the things of the world and all of its ungodliness, we separate from it. And so we live godly, not just waiting for the next life, but where? In this present world, even in our daily life, this is how we are to live. And then at the same moment, while we're living the Christian life here in this world, and that doesn't mean that you can't pursue happiness, that doesn't mean that you can't pursue enough to leave for your kids. In fact, Scripture admonishes us to. Parents should lay up for children and not children for parents. So there's nothing wrong with working and, and trying to, as we say in America, get ahead. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as it doesn't become first place on your agenda. But while we are working, while we're doing whatever we're doing, what do we be doing? Looking for that blessed hope. And what's the blessed hope for us as believers? The glorious appearing of the great God our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then see the next verse. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar or a set-apart people, zealous of good works. Of course we're going to do all we can to help fellow man. Nothing better than to help someone who is destitute. And that's all part of our being stewards of the mystery. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.